Hi everybody, and this is Miss Clemmy with the second of two videos on the excretory system. So what this little guy here is doing uh, is releasing urine, and um, by definition, every term in biology has a meaning and an actual name, and so that's called micturition, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Not only act of micturating, but um, the process of making the urine that's involved in micturating. And so um, I, I don't think the little boy is, uh, I think the little boy is voluntary, voluntarily micturating, but there is a name for bedwetting, and that's involuntary urination called enuresis. Uh, but the same can happen with uh, because those muscles get weaker as we age, and the the um, innervation that is needed for micturition may become um, weakened, and so that same process in adults is given a different name called incontinence. But it's really the same thing. There can be lots of different reasons uh, or micturation problems, believe it or not. Um, if you can't micturate, it could be because your kidneys are not producing urine, like in a severe kidney failure, which is called suppression, or perhaps your bladder, again, is not innervated properly, or there's some sort of disconnection with the smooth muscle control and the reflexes. And so if you can't empty the bladder, that's another term called retention. But let's first focus on the process of making the urine. And so if you look at this generalized schematic on the left, you'll see in yellow, that's kind of like the nephron. And um, the red is like the paratubular capillary. So blood goes in. It gets spun around and filtered like a centrifuge, and it goes out the paratubular capillary. And so that first step we call filtration. It's just a massive amount of, of, of blood getting filtered, and water and dissolved substances get pushed out into the filtrate. At that point, um, the next step is reabsorption, where um, the blood reclaims a bunch of what initially got filtered out. And so it picks and chooses. It says, oh, I think I need some more water. Let's, let's reclaim that water and some of those solutes like sodium and um, potassium. And you can see those arrows um, on the diagram pointing into the blood. The reverse can also happen. And this is a, a form of active transport where the, the blood says, I think we may have took a few too many things. Let's give the filtrate back a little bit of unwanted things. And so by the time we get down to the very bottom of the nephron, we've got a pretty good concentration of urine that can be micturated. That can go out the nephron into the collecting duct, the calyx, the renal pelvis, out the ureter, and stored in the bladder. So let's kind of take that process and break it down. Where does it actually happen? Where do those major steps happen inside of a nephron? And so the blue curly cues are the nephron, and the red are the paratubular capillaries. And so the first step in urine production is high pressure filtration. And it happens in the glomerulus, so blood goes in, and blood gets spun around in that ball of capillaries under really high pressures, almost like a centrifuge. And so in doing so, it releases massive amounts of water and solutes into the collecting Bowman's capsule. And that's the first step. Then the next step, which happens in the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle, is reabsorption. And so that's saying, well, you know, we probably took too much stuff out of the blood. Let's put some water and some solutes back into the blood. And so that happens in the PCT and the loop of Henle. The third step happens in the distal convoluted tubule, which is secretion, and that's when the arrows are going the other way. To fine-tune the concentration of urine, stuff is going back into the filtrate from the blood. And eventually, we get to the collecting duct over here, and that heads down to the, the ureter. Now, this is the, the same specific information is displayed as the previous slide but you can see it's a little bit simpler drawing. So the capillary kind of runs along the top, and you can see it's divided into the filtration, the tubular reabsorption, and the secretion. And you can kind of see those arrows that are going in the, the particular direction that those words um, suggest. And then we have urine going into the renal pelvis for the excretion. 
Now, let me just recap a couple of things and get you thinking about something you may not have thought about earlier. So the first step, we talked about high pressure filtration. It happens in the glomerulus in Bowman's capsule. And believe it or not, 180 liters of filtrate are created every day. 180 liters of water and solutes get dissolved or get filtered out of your blood. But we know for a fact we do not urinate 180 liters of fluid. That's why we know this second step has to happen. Most of what gets filtered out ends up being reabsorbed, primarily from that loop of Henle and the proximal convoluted tubule, maybe a little bit from the distal. Um, and this is where we can kind of see the problem ensuing with diabetics. Diabetics have frequent urination and have sugar in their urine, have glucose. And so they're not doing this step as efficiently as they should. Uh, moving on, the third step, secretion, that happens in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. That's where we really get the homeostatic fine tuning. So the hydrogen ions uh, may get secreted back into the uh, filtrate, which helps balance pH of our blood. Um, and these all help to, to fine tune and balance homeostasis as well. So if we kind of put those up here again, we have filtration under high pressure, we have reabsorption and secretion. Imagine if you had hypertension already, if you had high blood pressure. This process, especially this, these two up here, already happen under high pressure. So if you have um, high blood pressure besides this, it's even higher than in your kidneys and can cause permanent irreparable damage to them. So think about that. Um, if that's the case, if you have hypertension for many, many years, the first stage of kidney failure is perhaps some of those nephrons die. Those tiny, tiny tubules can easily get ruptured by high pressure. Um, the second stage is then we get to have even more nephrons are damaged. And so the bun level, which is kind of that nitrogen um, level that builds up and accumulates in your blood, that begins to rise because we're not getting the nephron and we're not having enough nephrons filter it out. And the third stage, um, at that point, you you're not working, your nephrons are not working as efficiently as they should. They can't keep up with the demand your body needs. And so you're either on dialysis and waiting for a transplant at that stage. And so you essentially go in very frequently um, a few times a week for hemodialysis, which is the uh, letting the machine filter your blood instead of your kidneys because they can't they, they can't cut it anymore. All right, so let me kind of recap again the importance of urine formation. So just remember what's not filtered out of your blood are like red blood cells and proteins. If they are, then we've got a pretty serious problem and we're looking at some kidney damage perhaps. What is saved and what is put back into your blood are all those dissolved ions that you're your nervous system needs and your bones need and in addition to water because we're land animals we want to save and conserve water as much as possible what is excreted as urine is are those nitrogenous wastes that your cells uh, accumulate extra water um, that we don't need um, if there's extra salts or extra vitamins like water soluble vitamins will get excreted out and if you're on any medications or things those byproducts can get excreted out as well just keep in mind that the, the process of filtering is not picky. Almost anything gets filtered out. What really is the important part is that what your, your nephrons choose to put back into the blood. That's a really picky and selective process. Not everything goes back in. So because of this, we can get different amounts of urine. Uh, and there's just some vocab that I just want to bring to your attention. Um, we don't want this to ever happen, anuria, that's a sign of kidney failure, um, but we do, uh, but these are some of those early warning signs. Oliguria is when we have very little urine produced, perhaps we're, we're dehydrated, and polyuria, often a sign of diabetics. Now, we can somewhat regulate how much urine we produce through the use of some hormones. So let me go through three of those and, and then we'll wrap things up here. So the first is if our blood is too concentrated, if it's too salty, so to speak, not enough water. So we need to get water 
into that blood fast. We need to tell our nephrons, you need to, you better not be wasting any water. So maybe we're dehydrated or if we've consumed a lot of salt. So what happens is your body releases, or your pituitary releases antidiuretic hormone, goes to your kidneys and makes them more permeable to water. It makes those nephrons um, release water back into the blood like crazy. So in doing so, your urine becomes much more concentrated, but your blood becomes much more dilute. Now, if you think about um, what it means, what an antidiuretic does, it, it does the opposite of a diuretic, which is what an alcohol is. Alcohol suppresses ADH, so you do urinate uh, much more frequently. Now, on the other hand, if our blood is already too dilute and we need some more solutes in, um, basically what happens is the opposite. We release aldosterone. And aldosterone then um, tells your nephrons to reabsorb sodium. Now, because of that, water will end up following by osmosis, but we'll still get those solutes back into the blood. So we get salt and a little bit of water into the blood quickly. So we increase the blood volume as well as the osmolarity. Um, and there's another one that's kind of related to that. Uh, if the blood has too much stuff in it, it's too concentration, concentrated, we release atrial natriuretic hormone, ANH. And so what that does, and my arrows are backwards here, that'll release sodium to be secreted back into the filtrate. So we get rid of it if it's too salty. Um, and then water will then follow um, by osmosis. So we'll get rid of some water into the, into the urine as well. And so that's a salt and water losing hormone. We end up um, excreting that. And so it does the exact opposite of aldosterone. Okay, so those are just some of the ways that we can um, try and maintain water balance and osmoregularity as a, as a way of regulating homeostasis. And I hope you found that helpful.